I'm wondering about uh, heat in terms of inflation. We got uh, inflation numbers today. The headline PCE goes up uh, to 4.2 percent, uh, faster than you had anticipated and uh, higher than had been anticipated by the Fed. Does that suggest to you that we might need to see uh, and I know taper comes first, but that we might need to see interest rates rise sooner than the market has been expecting? First, good morning. Uh, yeah, we're a little warmer, although I do miss uh, the view. <laughs> the view from my 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 office is my home office is a lot different. And uh, go fighting blue hands. Go University <laughs> of Delaware. Uh, so yeah. So on inflation, I mean, clearly it is a concern. Um, the word transitory, I think, has been used probably in some ways too much. Uh, but there are clearly sectors of the economy which are accelerating faster than others. That's always the case. The question in my mind to watch on inflation is, are we seeing spillover from these COVID-infected sectors to the non-COVID-infected sectors? And are expectations becoming unanchored? So far on the latter point, the answer is no, but it is clearly something we need to watch. And what we're hearing from our business contacts is that this may be longer lasting uh, than we had expected, they had expected. So it is clearly a risk uh, that we have to be cognizant of with respect to policy. Are those people telling you that uh, they are going to have to keep raising prices in order to make up their margins? What I hear from our contacts, business contacts, is they're working very hard not to raise prices. They are seeing some increase in productivity. The good news is we are seeing across the economy and in individual sectors increases in productivity, which helps mitigate some of the challenges they're facing. But it doesn't completely get rid of them. So, yeah, they're, they're concerned about this right now. I think generally they're very concerned. One major national home builder I was talking to recently said, you know, these supply chain disruptions we thought were temporary don't look as temporary uh, as we thought. They will eventually solve themselves like appliances. But right now they're putting in used appliances in the new homes and promising to deliver a new appliance because they simply can't get the appliances. In that case, because of chips to a large extent, we think about cars and chips. Well, there are chips in your dishwasher. <laughs> and sometimes they don't work in my dishwasher. Uh, <laughs> if if uh, the rest of the open market committee follows your advice and decides to start tapering fairly soon, what kind of message does that send at a time when people are very unsure about the impact of COVID on the economy? Yeah. So Delta is clearly a problem. And the next one, it, it's not just going to be Delta. First and foremost, we've got to get this pandemic under control. And the way to do that is get people vaccinated. This started with a health crisis. It's going to end by solving the health crisis, not by raising rates or lowering rates. So we need to keep that first and foremost, right in front of our mind. And we need to tell everybody this. So, yeah, I mean, given that, uh, given that this is a health crisis, I think we, we need to follow, as our colleagues, and Raphael was just on, have said, we really need to follow the data and see how things turn out over the next couple of months. We put these uh, systems in place, we put this accommodation in place because of the health crisis. And we will be able to remove it now because we are slowly, carefully chipping away at the health crisis, but we're not there yet. Uh, we talked a lot about inflation this morning, but what about the labor market? Uh, the yeah. committee in its uh, minutes of the last meeting suggested uh, you'd made progress, but not nearly enough. And even if we get a similar jobs report next Friday to what we had, you're still going to be about six million short. Uh, I I'm wondering yeah. if you expect to make up that difference uh, very quickly or if the participation rate is going to stay low and that might change your thought about the proper path for policy. To separate two things there, it's a good question. One is uh, the path of policy, but also uh, what is causing this? Uh, what's causing this? It's not a lack of demand. It's clearly not a lack of demand. We see that in the JOLTS data, lots of open jobs. People are still concerned about coming back to work. Uh, people are concerned about getting on transit, say in a city like Philadelphia to get to the workplace. People are concerned about going to the restaurant with the Delta variant, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so again, until we solve those problems and childcare and all the other things holding people back uh, from entering the workforce, that's going to be an issue. Unemployment insurance is rolling off. I mean, the expanded unemployment insurance, we are starting to see some of those early, early results from some states that removed the federal uh, unemployment early. Yeah, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like that's mm -hmm. having a huge impact on getting more people into the labor force. It's these other factors, life, <laughs> I put it as mm -hmm. simply as life, right? Taking care of kids, taking care of uh, the elderly parents, uh, getting to and from work that's causing this. So what does that mean for policy? If that, if what I just said is true, then adding accommodation or keeping a highly accommodative policy is not going to solve that problem. It's not going to close that gap. It's not a demand problem. It's a supply problem. Well, within that, and Patrick Harker, I think you're best situated of anybody within the Fed. I note that the Philadelphia Fed was 4 or 5% of the American population sitting on 1% of the land. It's a microcosm of this nation, the manufacturing index back to 1968. Great. What do you hear from the small, the mid, and the large business people of your district? So they're nervous. I mean, I think generally people are nervous and uh, about what the future holds. But that said, they are seeing lots of demand. I mean, our manufacturing contacts, our manufacturing business outlook survey, although it's ticked down a little bit in terms of future activity, it's still an expansionary territory. Their biggest problem, and you know this, is getting skilled labor. And by the way, we should put this in context in some of the work we're doing in the Philly Fed. This problem of skilled labor and labor generally was with us before the pandemic hit. The pandemic has just exacerbated the problem. It hasn't created the problem. We still need long-term structural solutions uh, to solving our labor woes. And that's the kind of work we're doing in our community development function at the Philly Fed and really across the Federal Reserve System. Well, at the Philly Fed, you said something that I think is just fascinating, Patrick, that some of the supply side issues that we're seeing in the labor market, the, the frictions there, are not solved by monetary policy. This isn't something that holding rates low for a longer period of time or even uh, buying $120 billion of bonds every month is going to solve in its own right. So how do you determine the potential negative ramifications from the ongoing $120 billion of purchases yeah. with the lack of uh, influence, frankly, on solving these labor market dynamics? So I have been on record and I continue to be on record that, that I would like to start the tapering sooner rather than later. I'd like to start it sooner rather than later, and I'd like to keep those, keep it as simple as possible. The old engineer and me, I'm trained as an engineer, you know, the old KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Let's just start this process, let's get that over with, and then we can start to think about the Fed funds rate and normalizing the Fed funds rate. We're not there yet. I'm right. still forecasting late 22, probably 23, um, before we do liftoff, but let's get the tapering process underway. Mike, let's engineer this Jackson Hole right now. Is this a Jackson Hole of complexity or simplicity, as the president speaks of? <laughs> well, that depends on whether you're uh, reading the papers, which are complex, or whether you are <laughs> talking about raising interest rates or uh, starting to taper. Uh, I'm wondering, Pat, if uh, you think that starting to taper is going to have an impact uh, this soon uh, on the whole Fed, the, the new framework, uh, the idea that you're waiting. Will people take that the wrong way and think that uh, you're giving up too soon? No, they, they might, but I, again, I, I don't think that's, a, that's appropriate. Uh, we have achieved our inflation goal, essentially. I mean, it, we're above 2%. Again, good news is expectations have not become unanchored, but uh, we are averaging above 2%. And Keeping this accommodation through tapering there for a long period of time, uh, when it's not solving the labor problem, that's not the problem. Just look at how many jobs are open in the U.S. economy, the JOLT data. Uh, I just think it, it's the prudent thing to do to just take this first move and then let's see how things play out before we think about any change in the Fed fund tree. Now, we talked about uh, whether or not the Fed has contributed to inflation by uh, propping up asset prices. Uh, a lot of people have said fiscal policy is contributing to inflation by putting a lot of money into the economy. And now down in Washington, they're debating hundreds of billions more. Uh, are you worried that that, uh, leaving aside the political merits of this, uh, are you worried it could be inflationary? 
Well, let's start with what we know almost exists. It's not done yet, but the infrastructure bill. Uh, as an old civil engineer, I'm all for fixing our infrastructure. It's in woeful shape across our economy. We need to fix it. So what's the implication, uh, what impact will that have on the economy? Well, I mean, the evidence I've seen, at least the modeling I've seen, is you know, that trillion dollars will have maybe one, two tenths of a percent impact on GDP. So we're not talking about a huge overall impact. In certain sectors, absolutely, but not overall. My biggest concern right now is not that it's going to overstimulate, that bill itself is going to overstimulate the economy. Is that where are we going to get the labor, the skilled labor, to fix the roads, to do the broadband work, and, and so forth? That we need a really intensive effort to get people into the labor force with those skills. Now, the broader issue of the three, three and a half trillion, that is, right now, I don't have a fixed opinion on that because really that's a moving target every single day, and it's very hard to model. Uh, mm -hmm. such a moving target. All right, very quickly, Pat. Uh, next Thursday, September 2nd, Delaware Blue Hens versus the Black Bears of Maine. Uh, winner? Ooh. Well, I'm always going to go with the Blue Hens. Come on. <laughs> I set <laughs> you up for everyone that. Everyone will be fully vaccinated. Patrick Harker, thank you so much.